So tonight, <laughs> hopefully, did anybody read this? I got halfway through. Okay. It's not a tough book, and I mean, you could see I, I had a lot of a lot of stuff that I saw that was I thought pretty solid in terms of uh, in terms of things that I found useful. Um, can anybody else hear me okay right now? Anyone? I can hear you. I know it's just you and me. I think we're all by ourselves. Nobody else is. I'm gonna unmute everybody just to see. You can hear me okay, Ruse? I'm just cooking. So it's okay. I just got in. You can, you guys can cook whatever you want to cook. Just share with us when you're done. So, um, so for, I know that Ruse, you can hear me. Adriana, you can hear me. Okay. Right. Yes. And Caroline, can you hear me? Caroline's there, but she's not. So, um, so for those of you who we were talking to, did, did anybody read this book at all? Or no? Yes, I read it a long time ago. Good. Do you have a copy with you? I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. <laughs> no worries. No worries. So, you know, the good thing is this, the book itself I found to be a great starting point. I didn't find it to have a ton of meaty, crazy, like thick stuff, but I think it stimulates a lot of really good decision um, making, a lot of good discussion that we can have. Um, you know, and the first thing that they really talk about in here, uh, you know, in my opinion, was kind of like, um, the, well, the concept obviously of raving fans, we're all aware of, right? The concept of wanting people, I mean, that's how we basically grow, all of us. We all grow by people going out and telling others about us. And I think if we could somehow manage to make our practices free of advertising, free of um, GPs, you know, free of having to rely on other people to, uh, that we have to sort of sell to and just create raving fans. I think we'd probably all agree that that would be our ideal practice. If you just worked and had people show up and you didn't have to do anything else. Uh, so to me, that's sort of an ideal practice. And so they, they go in here and they talk about a lot of the different ways you can do that. And so, one of the first things they talk about is, you know, developing a culture to some extent. And so I'll start the question that I'll sort of begin with is, what are each of you doing in your practices to create a culture where the people who come in sort of are, are really wowed by what's going on? Give me some examples of, of things you're doing in terms of creating that culture with your team. I know in our in my office, I try to make sure that um, and my staff make sure that everyone feels like they're at home when they come and visit us. And so uh, we always offer them, welcome them, and offer them something to drink every time they come. See if they need anything so that they're comfortable. We try to escort them back to the chair, but when they finish treatment, we also escort them to the door and thank them for coming. So. I've always done that, um, I, and most people really love that, but I always feel like there's more we could do. Right, so anybody else have anything else? I think, I think it, it all depends on the culture that you're creating, and sometimes I feel like it depends on who do you want to have in your practice, and then based on that, you have to create a culture that they will be your fan, and I don't think that you can you know, at least in my practice, I feel like I cannot accommodate everyone. I, I need to be like, you know, smart about, you know, setting up my culture and then, you know, deciding I want these type of patients and then just target those. And those are going to be my fan. So it's a great point. And it's something I've struggled with my whole career and I've gone both ways with it. So my question is, a patient comes in and you want to do a procedure on them and they don't want to do it your way. How do you respond? Oh, this is a tough question. I mean, sometimes I try to educate them and explain it. And I, I bend sometimes my, you know, culture or whatever. I don't want to call it rules, but like whatever that I'm setting up, sometimes I try to go around them uh, to some degree, maybe like one degree of standard deviation, if you want to talk about that. But I don't, I mean, I, I think you have to draw a 
line at some point. So you're talking about drawing a line related to treatment options or related to your team? Both of them. I think it's, it's just like, you know, treatment options sometimes. And like, I don't know, like when there's a case that you know that is an extraction, if you don't do an extra, non-extraction, you're really going to hurt the kid. I'll just say that I can't do it. I'm sorry. But, you know, if I really believe that is an extraction case, then, I mean, if it's a borderline, yes, I'll talk to the patient and I'll talk to the parents and I'll, you know, go what they whatever that I think that is going to be best and, you know, talk to the parents and see what they want. But if I firmly believe that, you know, an extraction case is an extraction case, then I won't do it. Okay. So you'll draw a line in the sand related to what you consider to be an appropriate treatment plan. Yeah. I mean, if, with everything, I think not necessarily treatment plan. Also, like if the patients want unrealistic, you know, stuff, you just say no at some point. So it's an interesting discussion, right? It, it takes up a lot of time to discuss on the web. Where do you draw the line of what you consider to be appropriate and not appropriate? And it, again, I've gone through a lot in my career about what I consider appropriate and not appropriate. And Caroline, I saw your comment, and we'll get to that in just a minute because I like that. Uh, I, I just want to chat real quickly about the fact that I used to go both ways with this. Uh, I would be very rigid. Um, I would not restore cases that were class two unless they went through ortho. Um, I was very, very rigid in terms of how I treated people. But I found, <laughs> I found that um, I got comfortable with, with bending the rules a great deal. And I think nobody can tell anybody else what to do, right? So if Ruse, you're comfortable with that approach, then you got to stick with it because it, it fits you well. I've, I, I've always felt that if I inform people fully of what they needed and I inform them fairly of the pros and the cons, you know, we're not doing um, heart surgery. We're not treating their brain, their liver, their kidney or lungs. And if they're well informed about extraction versus non-extraction, most of the time they're gonna take extraction. I don't really have people fight me on it. But for that rare case that says, no, nope, I don't want it. I wanna go non-extraction. I'll say, so you understand X, Y, and Z? Sure, good. Okay. I'm happy to treat you that way. And, you know, um, when Rebecca Bachow was my associate, we sort of came upon the idea that, you know, as long as I told people ahead of time that um, we were taking a trip together and I'm the captain of the ship, but they are the owner of the ship. And the owner tells the captain where to go and the captain tells the owner all the risks of the journey. And that, if, if my best plotted course was not one that they wanted, I'd be willing to do whatever they wanted as long as it didn't endanger the safety of the boat. And, you know, extraction, non-extraction, I don't mind that. I, so you're going to throw the lower anteriors out. Uh, I don't feel good about it. Um, there's really no good literature to support that what the long-term ramifications are. And I'll make it clear to them that they're, putting, they're technically, potentially putting themselves at risk for greater gum recession. Um, et cetera, et cetera. But as long as they go into it with their eyes open, they're, you know, they're a class two, div one, lots of overjet, and they just want straight teeth. I'm not going to say sure. I'm going to tell them all the pros and cons of doing it the way I suggest. I'm going to stand by my guns. And if they ultimately say no, then like Ruse's point, you have to make a decision. Am I comfortable just treating their smile? Um, or am I sort of drawing a line in the sand and saying no? I'm not going to treat you if you don't do it the way I want to, which is okay. But the difference between us and the dentists is that the dentist doesn't even tell them the pros and the cons and doesn't push the proper approach. At least I explained to them fully. Uh, I used the digital code diagnosis I went over, and I firmly believe they understand the pros and the cons of what we're doing. And so, Ruse, I hear you, man. You're not going to get any argument. And I think everybody needs to sort of figure out where they are. And I used to think that I wanted a specific kind of person. And then I realized after years and years of treatment, the only kind of specific person I want is the one who pays me and accepts my treatment. And um, I don't want jerks, but I wanted somebody who, um, who respected what I was doing for them, even if it wasn't the treatment plan I wanted. And it comes down to the discussion of autonomy versus paternalism, which we all had to learn in our, uh, in our programs. So Aruz, I'm not in any way putting down your approach. I think it's valid and, and honest and fair and you're true to yourself. And I think everybody has to sort of find their own level, right?
Rhoda, are you speaking? Yeah. Oh, there you go. I understand what Ruth is saying because sometimes I feel like um, patients come in and they just tell you what they want done. And so I give them their treatment options, but I always leave the option of no treatment um, as, as also a treatment option. But most of the time, once I discuss everything with them, um, I think I've only had a few patients that said no to no extraction at all. And then I say, hey, well, how about we evaluate it in a few months? You can see how the teeth are leveling out. And by that time, they start to agree because they start to build some trust in me. And so right. then they may go the extraction route. So, um, but I do think we have to, you know, be sure and kind of be uh, competent in our decisions because some of, some of the patients will just try to run you, like just command you and tell you what to do. And it's, it's hard to deal with those patients, but... I'm still trying to learn how to adapt to those patients. But that leads to another question. If a patient comes in and you inform them and they don't want to listen, and um, I'm trying to think of a scenario in orthodontics where we would do real harm to somebody. If someone really wants something, where do we draw the line? Is it scientifically based? Is it that we just feel a certain way, that we have a bias, uh, that we agree or disagree with an approach? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of my African-American patients are by max protrusive. And, um, you know, I'd like to take out four bicuspids and they generally, you know, will accept. But if somebody says, no, I don't want to, do we not treat them? That's the question. Where do we go? I just want to clarify that. I don't, I don't mean that, you know, and I do the same thing that you do probably. I just like, I feel like you have to educate them and you know go with it but right. but if there is a case i mean i don't know i the, it's really hard as you're saying like an author you can't really hurt the patient like it's it's really hard you really need to like do something major to like create some disaster right. but like when you get like a you know extremely retrognathic case and they don't want to take out teeth or they don't want to listen to anything any other like surgical option or whatever i leave them on excess over jet i don't have any problem with that as long as you know, this is, this is my line. This is, this is where I draw it. I was like, right. I can't fix your widget. I'm just going to leave it. I'll align the teeth. I'll give you the smile that you want, but this is what we're going to go. Right. Now I hear you. And it's, it's interesting because we all tend to focus on the clinical side, right? Which is why I'm bringing this up today, right? Because this really focuses on the patient, not on what we want, right? Um, and I liked Caroline's comment about how she renovated an old house. So feeling the comfort of home is what she stresses. Caroline, if you, can you hear us at all? Are you able to talk? Do you have a mic to sort of expand on that a little bit? I'll take that as a no. So again, um, the question becomes where does you know, I, I could go through everything in this book one by one, but I like the books that sort of stimulate discussion. And, you know, there's a comment in here that says, no worries, Caroline, take your time. Um, it says, create a vision. So it says, decide what you want, right? That's on page 41, decide what you want. And then it says, create a vision of perfection centered on the customer, right? So do you and your team sit down and discuss how you're going to create an exceptional patient experience? We already discussed a little bit about what it is that makes, makes us feel good and where we draw the lines and, and the kind of patients we want. But do you spend any time working on the customer experience? Do you, here's a, I'll start. How many of you have had phone training from a professional for your team? I don't do it through a professional, but I had it. Like I have a script for everything that I talk to the you know, the, my one man, one, one man band show, she knows all the scripts, like not following the details, but like, like one of the argument, I mean, not argument, but like discussion that we had today, it was like, I asked her specifically to call the patient after the initial contact with web, and she texted the patient. I was like, you shouldn't do that because the first connection, I mean, they started through the web, but now you need to pick up the phone and talk to these patients as opposed to texting them again. I mean, sometimes we get comfortable with what is the easiest way to do it. And that goes back to the customer service, to the connection to the people. So I 100% agree with you. I think that's a huge part. 
So I'll, I'll tell you that I have pretty good phone skills and I hired a professional phone trainer for my team and it made a huge difference. I'm about to, I did that as a GP and I'm about to do it again in the next you know, year. Um, the scheduling institute with Jay Geyer, I know orthodontists who've hired them to do just phone training and watch their case acceptance go through the ceiling. I am so, gonna sign up for that. So yeah. share the information if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if I can somehow get them to do a web conference with us to sort of go this, do this a little bit. But the phone call is so huge because we've talked about it a little bit, um, discussing in the past, things in, in the other, one of the other web conferences about, for instance, just asking who else in the family needs a, an exam, right? While, while Cindy is in, is there anybody else in the family we can look at? And you know, that alone is gonna get you a few patients here and there because the parents weren't thinking of their sibling or themselves. You know, the, tr the trial closed that Leanne Panici teaches is, is huge. So great phone skills trained by a professional, I think will start helping to become a, a raving fan. Because nothing irks me more than when you have bad phone skills, right? When somebody, somebody just doesn't care, or even if they do care, but don't quite understand how to get their point across. Brody, you okay? I keep watching you look up like there's a spider above you. No, it's just my children still in the grapes. Oh. Sorry, it's the kids. My husband's still at work. It's okay. It doesn't bother me. I just... I kept watching you look up like there was something above you about to descend. <laughs> so, so my, so my, like today, I'll give you a quick example of what happened today in the office. Um, I, I had a parent, I do free a lot. I do free retainers. I try to help people out. And so I had a parent who came in and moved from California and uh, I did a <laughs> for their kid. And we make sure, you know, it was a, um, it was a Friday afternoon. I wasn't working. Sabbath for me starts Friday night at sundown, and it's, a, it's an important time for me. And uh, I was getting ready with my family about an hour and a half before t sundown, and my assistant paged me and said, um, I was giving the retainer, the free retainer to this mom, and she's really upset you're not here. And uh, I said, why? She says, because, you know, um, I'm having a hard time. It was a, a like a metal plastic retainer with a pontic on it. And the only time the mother could come was Friday and I wasn't there. So I got in my car and I drove 20 minutes and I got to the office and I smiled and I could have been belligerent, right? I could have been like, oh, you no, know, I know she couldn't help me. You could have let her try it, but I just walked in, smile on my face, happy to help you, let me fix this for you. And I fixed it and it was great, everybody was happy. So mom, the kid just finished ortho in California, but he needed two implants, it was a mess. So long story short, Mom brought the daughter in today, the other, the other kid. She started Invisalign today. The son needs a retreat, and he's a surgical case. And so she's starting him with me. And it's just kind of funny how, you know, just coming into the office with a smile on my face, and, and you know, I walked up to the office and I was really pissed because, you know, I didn't have to come to the office. I could have said to the assistant to tell her to come back another day, but she, the, the mom was already kind of one of these high maintenance folks. And I think we sometimes have to have that mind shift of, I'm so pissed off. Who does she think she is? Why are they doing this? You know, I'm right. They're wrong. But instead, on the way into the office, I just kept saying to myself, be in a good mood, be in a good mood, be in a good mood. I got nothing to prove. And I went in there, you know, and she was happy. I was happy. I got home in time. Everybody was in a good mood. The drive wasn't so bad. And I ended up getting two new patients out of it. And sometimes we get into really upset, angry moods, or we get into these I'm right, you're wrong, who does she think she is, who does he think he is, and we tend to, to draw these lines in the sand related to relationships. And I think that that's a great example of where we, we can all have a, a mind shift of seek first to understand, then to be understood. And I think if we, if we think like that a lot of times, you know, we will create raving fans when we go um, above and beyond and try to help these folks. Do you guys want to throw anything on that topic? I had the same thing, um, something similar happened. Doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> I had something similar happen today. I had a, a college student, she was home for vacation um, and we scheduled her two appointments, one to check and make sure she's ready for a D-bond and then we scheduled her to D-bond appointment so she could have the time while she's in town. 
Well, her mother called 15 minutes into the appointment and said they were going to be 20 minutes late. And it was a 30 minute appointment. And we actually leave at three o'clock. So she would have been coming right before everyone left. And we got there at 630 this morning. So I thought about this book, <laughs> how to create a raving fan. And I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, my God. But and my staff was like, no, you always let her get away with it. And I was like, well, we're just going to, she's going to, you know, get her braces off soon. So let's just do it. And she came in and we took care of it. And we still got out on time. So it was just changing the mindset of the staff. And at the end, my um, scheduling coordinator, she said, oh, that's how you're creating raving fans. So I had been talking about it all week as I was trying to finish the book. <laughs> but um, I thought that that, was act that actually stood out because they were on board to what I was trying to do for what I was trying to do. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of funny how nine times out of 10, we, we imagine these horrible scenarios. Oh, they're coming late. We're going to get out late. And it, always it almost always works out. And we look back. I can tell you, I've looked back when I've made these decisions where I said, nope. If she's five minutes late this time, I'm not seeing her. And they show up 10 minutes late and the front desk dismisses them and says, go home. And then you just feel like crap. It's like, why did I, why did I do this? Why did I not just help them? And, you know, you know, and I think the teams often play a role in trying to get us to do what they want, right? Like your team. Why do you let her do this? Why do you let her step on you? And did anybody else want to add anything to this? Yeah, team, I agree. Team is always, they're always thinking that the patients are trying to take advantage or they're lazy or they're always late. But I think you have to stress out to the team that it's all about the patients. It's not about them. Right. I agree. Yeah. And I Actually, like I had to go to my office Saturday, last Saturday because of a motion appliance that came off and obviously it's one of the kids that can never miss one hour of school of course and i was like okay just come on saturday i'll meet you there at 11 o'clock and i redid it and mom was so appreciative we had a great conversation and we created a, another raving fan nice by the way was it a metal or a, a clear it was a motion uh, class three. Clear? Oh, it's metal. just metal. 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 Yeah. Ruse, were you going to say something? I think it all depends on, um, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I've worked in the kind of like a company setting and private practice, like so many different locations. It all goes back to what orthodontist thinks about the patient. I feel like most, most of the staff, they follow the team. It, they they just always complain about everything. But if they see that you're very receptive about the patient and you're just like, I've had like the, the most challenging moms that they're like, I don't want to wear a rubber band, blah, 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 blah. And then into a point that they're like the champion of rubber band. It's like, you just have to let them, you know, do whatever they want to do and, and just hear them out and they will change. And I feel like the staff complain if they see that you're also complaining. And I feel like if you, if the orthodontist is like, all about like, let's just do everything for the patient. The staff will change a little bit. Yeah, I agree with you. And you know, there's, there's an interesting point in the book where he says, when a customer complains, you know you're hearing the truth. Listen to him. When a customer is a raving fan and is enthusiastic, listen to him too. But when a customer is silent, or it says, fine, with a smile, you have to really perk up your ears. You've got a problem. If nothing else, that customer is not a raving fan. And it, so that leads to the question is, how are you finding out from your patients if, what they think of your practice? What kind of things have you all done, if anything? There you go. I feel like you have to be always receptive to, I mean, I don't know, like, I feel like when you chat a lot with your patient, it will come up. You don't need to do anything about it. You just be like open, talk to the parents and they will tell you if they're not happy about something or they bring it up. Sometimes they bring it up nicely. Sometimes they're like, you know, a little bit more different tone. I don't know. 
I think you have to be just always on the floor chatting with everybody in the I, I would I would give you a slight uh, challenge on that statement because I think the vast majority of people aren't going to say a word. Um, at least for me, I've noticed over the years, and thankfully, at least to my knowledge, we haven't had a lot of patients who haven't been happy. But they often don't say a word. Now, in ortho, it's different. They're typically not going to change doctors in the middle of treatment, right? I mean, it's, I think it takes a lot to force a patient out of your practice to where they want to go be treated by another local orthodontic, orthodontist. Um, but I, I don't think, unless we physically ask them, I don't know if we know how the majority of our patients feel about us. You know, they'll come up and say, you're great, you're amazing, you're wonderful. But I know there's got to be people in my practice who aren't happy with it, maybe. Um, there's got to be some. I mean, you treat 500 people, 1,000 people. I mean, odds are, it's hard to imagine that you've made 500 people happy. You know, maybe one woman isn't happy. You made her kid wear rubber bands, but she's not going to say anything to you. You know, maybe one mom doesn't like the fact she has to come on Tuesday through Thursday, and you're not open Monday or Friday. You know, there's got to be somebody. And like Rishi said, I like the idea of polling them and finding out because it's funny. I don't want to hear compliments. I mean, it's nice, and they work well for testimonials. I want to hear the bad stuff. I want to hear how I can get better, right? Does, does anybody here do surveys? Because I saw Rishi said uh, doing surveys. Are you able to hear me at all? Yes. I, I'm trying to implement surveys right after each appointment to see if they are telling us anything else that we need to know. What, so how are you doing that? With the um, solutions reach. So you're sending it as part of your uh, secure email? Correct. Okay. And how, how do you collate the, I mean, how many do you send out? Do you send out in the five or we're, 10 or 100? We're just, we're just in the process of doing it. So we're just starting. Okay. So when you get the results, how are you going to review them? Are you going to look at them yourself? Or are you going to have somebody in the office collate them? How do you envision you're going to handle them? I. My plan is to look at them myself. Okay. Are you going to share them with the team? Yes. So there's the question. Um, how do you share negative feedback with a team member? Uh, do you pull them in aside privately? Do you talk in generalities about the office to the whole team at a meeting? Right? For instance, you got a review back that says, when the f I have to wait too long on hold when the phone is answered. Or I get the voicemail too often. Do you have a meeting with your whole team and say, hey, um, one of the biggest problems we're seeing is that people don't want to, don't want to hold or they're not getting the phone. So everybody, we're going to set a policy that if you hear the phone ringing, go grab it. Or do you approach your scheduling coordinator and say you're in charge of the schedule, which means you're in charge of the phone. And if you don't take the people under you and train them properly, you're responsible for that. Everybody needs to be able to answer the phone and it's your responsibility, not mine. How do you handle that? I, I think... Over the years, I, I feel that it's better to empower the whole team to come up with solutions than just to point it out to one person to begin with. And then if things don't change or if there is just one person that is the guilty person, <laughs> then, you know, talk to that person. But I think in order to have everybody in agreement how to make things work better. I think you have to empower the whole team. So you have to talk with all. So what questions is everybody asking? In, in the survey? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of questions are you asking? We're, so we're just uh, collecting how was your experience today is there anything else that we can do better then there's a, a small space for them to fill out some information um how do you rate us today you know certain questions like that how was your weight uh is there anything else did you have a, a good time you know some very generic uh questions but some are specific in terms of the weight uh, the time that they were seeing that if everybody was uh, nice to them and All if right. they had a good experience. I'm going to offer you a suggestion because mm -hmm. I've done this many times and in my experience, you're going to get very poor results. Um, the more generic your questions, the more generic your answers, the less helpful they are to you. 
So I, I would simply ask one question at the beginning. On a scale of one to 10, how was your experience in our office today? And then the second question, if it was less than 10, what, what could we have done better to make it a 10? Oh, that's a good idea. That's, I'm just, I, it's not mine. I mean, I've just learned it over the years. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate today's visit? If it was anything less than a 10, what could we have done to make it perfect? Boom. Mm -hmm. Why go fishing for waiting room? Or we don't even call it a waiting room, right? We call it a reception area. Why go fishing about the reception area or the phone or, or putting ideas in their head? Just ask them, how was it? If it was a 10, you'll get a 10. If it was a yeah. seven, they'll say seven. And you say, what could make it better? I waited too long. Okay, good. You'll start to see a pattern emerge. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have any? I saw that Rishi said, we mix up questions regarding their interests as well as their reason for choosing us and how their experience has been. The question regarding their interests are to disarm them and for marketing insight. Okay, no argument there. I would just, I would just say, keep, your, keep it very short. We've all answered surveys. We get tired of them. And you know, I don't want more than two or three questions because I'm going to start losing people. But if you're getting great results doing that, keep going with it, man. Um, I noticed that you discuss them at lunch meetings every two weeks to go over team-wide issues. We do a meeting once a week. Um, but again, I try to check in with my team uh, once a day. You know, I try to see them, chat with them. If I see something, I'm going to pull them aside right away and talk about it. Um, my weakness at times is to be a micromanager. You know, I want things done my way. And I think a lot of us have that in us. And when I learned to let go, it got better. Um, but, you know, in this book, Ken Blanchard says, um, it says, discover what the customer wants and deliver plus one, right? So d delivering plus one is, I think, the key to customer service, right? Everybody, everybody comes to the orthodontic office. So here's my question. How many of you... Um, how many of you um, have patients who tell you straight up they came to you for reasons other than you being a good orthodontist? A lot of them. <laughs> so, so why do they come to you? What do they tell you? I think one of the things for me is the scheduling because I'm the only one who's open on Friday. I, I would argue with you, Ruse, that, that they come for you for other reasons. At least this is what they told me. Maybe okay. there are other reasons. So they, they straight up say, to you, I'm coming to you because you're open on Friday? Yeah. Okay. I, I would believe that they've heard something good about you from somebody about something. <laughs> That's no, true. I mean, I, I have a hard, Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are open on Fridays. Why did they choose Ruse, right? Um, there's got to be something. I, I'll tell you, I get so many new patients now because they say they love my Instagram feed. It's the craziest thing. And, um, you know, I just had a woman today say, you know, I saw you on Instagram and you guys look like so much fun. And I see you go to a lot of continuing education. And so I went on your Facebook and I looked and checked your reviews and they were good. And it's just so funny how people become raving fans just from the silliest little things, right? The fact that I have a fun office would you ever choose a healthcare provider because they look fun? I mean, it's insanity. So I, I, I will just tell you what Gary Vaynerchuk always says, which is double down on your strengths. Whatever you, what, whatever you think makes you successful, whatever your strength is, if you're a great communicator, then double down on it. If you like to be goofy and funny, double down on it. If you're, if you're uh, all that digital, like Kyle, Go all in on it, right? Do, uh, do some blogs and do whatever. But there comes that moment because raving fan really means people talking about you. And anything that gets people talking about you, I think is good for you. And you know, all of you are aware of that on hold message I did two weeks ago? Have you guys, I posted on it. It's in RD. I, I'm just a goofball. It's what I am. I like to joke. I'm very serious about my ortho, but I, I just like to have fun. I'm, I just laugh and joke all day long. And so I made an on hold greeting message that's nothing but me telling the corniest jokes in the world. I just, and I put background music to it and it plays for three minutes and it's me telling the dumbest jokes on earth. But I just say, hey, you're on hold. This is Dr. Krieger. I'm going to torture you with some jokes while they, they put you on hold. And, and people have been calling my office 
to hear just the on hold message um, and telling their friends to call my office just to hear the on hold message. And so what, whatever your strength is, I think if people know it's genuine, you're going to develop raving fans from that. Does anybody have anything to say about that? I agree with it. Was that Caroline? Oh, yeah, I finally got it working. Hey, Caroline. <laughs> Hi. I don't think I've spoken to you in forever. I know. Caroline and I went to school together. She was a year behind me. So we're just going to have a conversation for an hour. <laughs> uh, no, I would say recently something that's helped me. Oh, that I think, you okay? Yeah, was that me doing that? I think it was. But oh, you, okay. you can Maybe it was might have been the dog who knows um no i know recently with me i've been really trying to get around to um since i'm new get around to the dentists that are near me because i'm the only one orthodontist in my area for about 20 minutes at least and nice. um so i know i've had some recent referrals um from dentists saying um you know the patient saying that Oh, the dentist said that they met you and that you um, were so sweet and caring and that we had to come see you. Um, you know, so I'm not necessarily, I'm kind of the opposite of you of don't really, not really a goofball or anything or, um, but, you know, I think just constantly showing I care. Um, and I tell them too that since I am new, I do it to my emergency phone where it's a call forwarding to my cell phone. And I let them know whenever I bond them or anything like that, that I'm always available because I'm just open three days a week right now. So I let them know, I guess it's kind of like a comfort thing for them. So when I do have patients call me like on a Monday or Tuesday, I always answer and I'll have the moms, you know, saying like, oh my gosh, Dr. Caroline, you are not supposed to be answering right now. It's a Monday. I just wanted to call and leave a message, you know. Um, so things like that, I think have helped a lot um, and just kind of, I guess, show who I am for them. Nice. So you talk, you mentioned a very interesting point. So we talk about raving fans and we talk about our, our patients. How do we create raving fans out of the dentists? Because that's another potential stream, right? You, you hit one patient, do a great job. They tell their friend, you get a dentist into a raving fan. You can get 50 patients from them. So what is the key to getting a dentist to be a raving fan? What are your thoughts? I don't know. I guess like what I've tried to do is um, call ahead and make time to meet them and really get to know their staff too. And I, um, you know, tell them that I'm going to take care of their staff. And um, I don't know. So I think that's kind of what's helped me so far with the dentists that have been really good at ref, uh, referring for me right now. Nice. Anybody else want to throw anything in there? Andre? I think it's kind of difficult where I am because uh, there's mostly male or male general dentists here. And so a lot of them don't do lunches with females. And so um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to get to know them. So even though we visit their offices and I, and I will go with my staff as well, um, sometimes I'll get to meet them and sometimes not. But it's also a little bit more difficult for me because my husband's a general dentist and they may know him from the study club, but they don't necessarily know me because I don't attend their study club meetings. So I found that um, pretty difficult um, to, to actually meet and get to know some of those dentists. They kind of all just stick with the same uh, orthodontist that they've been with for so long, and I don't really know how to change their mindset. Do you practice with your husband? We practice in the same building, or pretty much in the same suite, but we just have uh, different offices, completely different staff and different office names. So, um, it's pretty much like he'll, he'll refer me patients, but we don't share staff or business. But I'm sure you're aware of the public image. It, it, it's very difficult when you practice with your husband who's a GP, because I was a general dentist um, and I used to refer 
and I had people who practiced in the same building and descent, I don't mean to sound bad, but I wouldn't refer to them only because I didn't know them. And, and I think if you can somehow convince them to trust you and have that, you know, that's the big pink elephant in the room is that, you know, if I send a patient to her, her husband's going to steal him. And, right. and you may never think that way. And he may never think that way. But the general dentists think that way. I can promise you. So I, I make it clear to them when I go and visit their office. I'll, I don't make it a secret. Like I let them know. I'm like, oh, you, you probably know my husband, Dr. Moore, because I practice by my maiden name. So, um, and they'll say, yes, we do actually. And then I'll just make it clear that, you know, whatever patients you'll send, you send over, we'll surely send them back. We'll do diagnostic letters and feedback. And I've had quite a few refer, but I still think some may be skeptical, of course. Yeah, I would get in with the staff. I mean, that's the key for you, in my opinion, is if you can't get lunch with the doctor, bring lunch for the staff and give CE. Mm -hmm. You know, give CE that's relevant to them. Like I said, I teach clinical photography, right? And sure, that's my thing. But you know clinical photography better than most general dentists, right? The old saying in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So they don't know how to do it at all. And if you go in there and show basic mirror and retractor usage, you're, you're like a king to them. So then with the staff, you can even tell them, I don't need the doctor there. I'm just going to bring lunch and I'll work with the team on clinical photography and talk about how to present care. And, you know, they're not going to refer right away. But if you do it four or five, six times, I think, you know, at some point they're going to turn to the doctor and say, you've got to meet her. She's amazing. That's just what I found, especially when I was a GP. I, I have had, can you, can you hear this, Glenn? Can you guys yeah. hear this? Yeah, you're great. I've recently had uh, two or three dentists that I, that I connected with uh, just through mutual patients that weren't really referred by them. But, you know, I saw who they went to and I just made a phone call. Um, hey, we, we are treating this patient. I just wanted to kind of... Uh, see if we could get together for lunch and talk about uh, my treatment plan for, you know, for this patient. And uh, it actually went pretty well with these, with these two, I think it was two dentists actually just recently this last month. So that, that worked out well because I've always had a little bit of difficulty to getting, getting the dentist to go and have lunch with me. It seems like it's hard battle to do that, at least with, with me anyways. It is. And, and they won't even have lunch with me. The doctors in my area, are, I have one doctor who's such a jerk. He practices 200 yards from me. We're the only two doctors for a couple of miles, for a mile, mile and a half. And his patients come into me, even though he doesn't refer to me. And I'll call him to do exactly what you said and say, hey, I just want to chat with you. And he'll actually say to me every single time, we, I joke about it with my team. He'll say, I don't want to talk about this patient. She wastes my time. I'm not going to invest any more time in this person. So if you want to treat her, great, but I don't want to talk about her. And I, what, are you, what are you going to say to that, right? He, he's just a jerk. So I've just moved on from those kinds of people. And the overwhelming majority of doctors in my area are horrible, horrible doctors. They're terrible. Um, my number one referrer last year sent me nine patients in the entire year. They, and I know for a fact from other specialists that I am her only referral for ortho. So in an entire year, she only saw nine patients that she thought needed ortho. Crazy, right? She's doing, she's probably doing a lot of Invisalign though, right? I mean, something, no? No, no. she's doing very little Invisalign. Um, I only know that because I helped her with Invisalign and got to get into her case and see how many she's doing. Um, she, they're just not, I have horrible quality doctors near me. But your point is well taken. You want to pick up the phone whenever you have a new patient. And if nothing else, call them and say, hey, Dr. Smith, I just want to talk to you real quickly. I don't need your time for lunch. Um, I just want to tell you real quickly, I'm seeing your patient, Rhoda, um, really sweet gal. Uh, I just wanted to fill you in real quick. This is a kind of a complicated case. And I'd love to meet with you after work just for 10 minutes to go over it because I think, and here are the magic words, there might be some restorative work you need to do after we're done. Oh, you mean I can make, a, make money? Oh, right. okay. Uh, I can meet now. And yeah. it's, it's funny because I told one doctor who's a real jerk, real jerk. I said to him, yeah, I'd love to meet with you this patient because I think they're going to need a full set of veneers. 
after we're done. And uh, he would never, ever talk to me, wouldn't call me back. I told my partner or my front desk, I can't remember who, I said, what's your bet that I get a phone call at 7.30 tomorrow morning before we start? And at 7.34, the phone rang. Can I speak to Dr. Krieger? I got to set up this up. She said, oh, he's not available. 8.15, he called me back again. At 11 o'clock, he called the third time. All because I said there might be some veneers in this when we're done. There's such money hungry, grubbing. It's, it's unbelievable. But again, um, you know, when I have an oral surgeon who's the king of marketing, and what he does when he has a new doctor he works with is um, he'll send a copy of the CBCT, he'll have it driven over to their office so that they have it on a card, and he'll attach some goodies with it. So like the first time I'll work with a dentist, I really should send over like a box of cookies with the, the findings report, you know, have one of my assistants just drop it off. And it's something I may start doing more of in the future. You know, it, it works really, really well. And he's sort of the master of doing that. So well, it's, some, a good idea. it's not my idea. I just sort of borrow from somebody else. Right. But yeah, but it's good. I like it. Yeah. It, it's just, it's just a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, I don't have a CBCT, but if I did, I would definitely put it onto a, one of those flash drive cards that looks like a business card, and I would send it over with a box of cookies or something. And every time he takes a CBCT on one of my patients, he has one delivery woman who comes over, drops it off, and we know there's going to be cookies and something or whatever with it. And it's a really, really nice way to do things. You know, maybe maybe a similar concept would be to do, I mean, maybe just like a like a flash drive or something with the, with the pictures, the panel, the diagnostic letter. Plus Ruse, the Ruse just said, send the STL files. It's the same thing. <clears throat> if you're scanning. Yeah. Yeah. Can they, so Ruse, you're my digital guru. Can they view the STL files? <laughs> I just, I got to tell you, Ruse, I love your original picture with the two. I don't know if you still have it with the two black glasses. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. But, um, but my question for you, Ruse, is can they just open an STL file on their computer or do you have to add software? Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can put the mesh uh, mixer or mesh lab. There's so many open sources software that you can put it there and then you're really good with creating video. You just one instruction, give money to somebody in fever or I can do it, honestly. Like, you know, um, this is how you open the file. So this is the open source software. This is the STL, and I honestly, I've been working on trying to figure out to put my STL file on my Word document, and it's, it's a little clunky. Microsoft hasn't figured it out completely, but they will get there, I can guarantee you. Well, then, you know what? If you can find, I'll make a deal. You find the open source software that's the best, and then you and I can work on it, and I'll make the video that we can all share, and we'll do it as a, we'll do it as a whiteboard video, Sure. So it'll cost me nothing to make it. And then we can share that under files so that any time we want to share it, you just pull down that, that whiteboard and mm -hmm. um, just uh, can we make a whiteboard autoplay when they plug it in? I don't know, honestly. We'll look um, into that. I'll see what I can find out. We can. I mean, it's, it's not like what we do the, in terms of 3D imaging that we're using is just like, it's so outdated compared to everything else that, you know, that the industry is doing. So it's, it's very easy to do it. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. I figure, I figure it should be. It'd be kind of, it'd be kind of cool to, to do that for your doctors and what have you, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to drop it in there. I mean, I tried to set up there um, cause I have the three shape and I've been working with some of them to try to set the, um, the communicate the three shape communicate for them. But um, their computers are not so fast, so it's just, it's clunky. I think the best thing would be to put it on a flash drive with the, it's kind of like a viewer that you have with CBCT. You just tell them that drag this from here, put it in here, install it in your computer and do it. It's very easy to do it. And they're going to go crazy. I promise you they're going to go crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Doug, I'm muting you because you're loud. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't know I was still on. Yeah, you're, uh, I'm just muting. I got you. Um, you know, it's about 8.55, and downstairs I have my in-laws and my best friend. And so um, I'm going to try to end this at 9 if it's okay with you guys. But I like the idea of the whiteboard because that's been golden, and I think it'll be fun. Um,
But I, there was a line on page 123 of the book that I really like, and I'm going to bring it up to you guys. It says, customers have needs beyond the need of the company's product, whether it comes in a box or as a particular service. People need to feel they belong to the group. People need to feel that they're important and that what they do, think, and say truly matters. Deliver that kind of hug with everything else you've learned and you'll create raving fans for sure. It's all about people. I've never heard it put better. And, you know, I think when you look at some of the more successful practices out there, I think you can sort of feel the culture of, you know, that, that people feel special to be a part of that particular group, right? Nobody, I don't think anybody, few people who are not engineering types choose a doctor because just because of their skill. And we've all had great doctors who were jerks that we chose to leave. So I think one of his best points is just creating a culture, creating something where your team feels like they're a part of something special, whatever that is. And I think that you'll find your team and your patients will match you. Like I don't have a lot. I don't have a ton of patients who don't have a sense of humor. I mean, I'm very serious about my ortho and I try to make everybody feel warm and welcome. And, and that goes without saying, but I don't have a lot of patients who don't have a sense of humor or maybe they choose me because they know that I'm going to have a lot of fun, right? I'm going to, I'm going to be very serious about the ortho, but I mean, we're going to joke today. Salt and pepper was playing on the radio, you know, um, push it, you know, was, was on and everybody's giggling and laughing because it's just not a song. I, and I think I said out loud, we might be the only ortho office in America playing salt and pepper at this very moment. And this girl was putting in her, uh, her expander and the mother had the key. And I just kept saying, push it, <laughs> push it real good. And the mother was dying laughing and the kid was laughing. And it's just like the kind of thing that like 99% of orthodontists would never say. But like she was high-fiving me afterwards. The kid thought it was the funniest thing. And again, I'll go back to what I said originally. Be true to who you are and, and don't try to change that. And it goes back to my purple suit syndrome, right? Don't put the suit on that's not who you are. Put the suit on that fits who you are and create that culture in your office where word spreads about your culture. Whether it's, you know... Dr. You know, Dr. Andre is like the greatest guy on earth. Wait till you talk baseball with him. He loves baseball. You know, if you like baseball, you got to talk to him about this. Or, you know, Dr. Lockett likes this. Or Dr. Shaw likes this. Or Dr. Caroline likes this. And I think people come in, they hear about you. They know about you before they've ever met you. Because your other patients, when they talk about you, they're not going to just say, wow, Dr. Shaw does amazing ortho. They're going to say, Dr. Shaw does great ortho and he's so funny or his team is so funny or his team is so nice. Um, am, I, am I hitting a nerve here? Am I totally off base? What are your thoughts on this? I agree 100%. Most of the people already do research to get into your office. They look in the website, they look on Facebook, they look everywhere, they hear from other patients. So when they get in, they just want confirmation of what they have seen. And if they feel good, they're probably gonna go with you. So Adriana, you've been in my practice, right? Yep. Um, would you say, with all honesty, um, and for no fear of hurting my feelings, okay, would you say that I've developed a culture in my office that's different than maybe some of the other offices out there? Yeah, I agree. I think you, you developed your culture. Exactly. That's totally you. It's your office. That's the way it is. Everybody is having fun, the music, you joke with everybody. That's exactly who you are and that's your office. Right, but would you agree that the culture I've built, you might take some things away from it, but it's not gonna be the same as your office? Correct, yes. Right, and, and again, I, I wanna just, it's gonna circle back now to the very beginning when Ruse started with his comment that he thinks, you know, he picks people who come to him and I would argue it's the other way around. I think they pick you. I think the people who are really uptight the people who are looking for a doctor who's very stiff, lots of oak paneling, you know, leather chairs, I don't think they're going to come to me. 
I think they're going to go find somebody else who might be that 65 year old orthodontist down the block. And it took me a while to get okay with that. Right. Cause it hurts when somebody doesn't want you. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I just want to also say one more thing. I think it's imperative that we visit each other's offices. And um, I was talking with Tim Finelli the other night, and he and I are going to do a home and away. I'm going to go with my, T, with my TC to his office, um, and then the next day he's going to fly back with me so we can chat and bring his TC back with my TC so they can chat on the plane and discuss things, and he'll watch my practice for a day. And I think there's a lot to be learned from this group where we, we, we have a group of people we can go learn culture and see what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And um, I would encourage all of you to find somebody, you, you all, whoever signed up for that accountability partner, Tim is mine. So you needn't go any further than the person you've been paired up with because they're probably in a similar trajectory as you are. And if you haven't, let me know and I'll see if I can pair you up with somebody. But I do think... I try to visit an office once a month. Every month, I go to at least one office on a day off. And I think it's so important for us to do that because we need to see the cultures in these other offices and see how others are making raving fans. And Adrian, I'm going to be in Austin at some point to come watch you. All right. Yeah, we just have to arrange that. So, Hey, Glenn. Yes. Yeah. So on that quick question, I know you got to wrap it up right now. No I got time for you. Quick question uh, on the subject of visiting, visiting another offices. So whenever, cause I, I'll be honest, I have not been doing a whole lot of that, but I, but I, but I want to, but I'm always a little hesitant that I'm going to kind of bug the other orthodontist. So how do you, how do you go about it? Like, so when you go, where do you, are you like watching, you know, patients in the clinic? Are you shadowing the ortho all the time? Or are you kind of talking to different staff? Or if you're by yourself, if you have a, t- a staff member with you, I understand you can, you know, be in one place and have her be with the other place. But if you're by yourself, how do you, how do you spend your day and not bother people? So, you know, it, it really comes down to, are you that person who has no social grace? Right. And I don't think you are. I think, you know, if you've got social graces, if you understand people, you know, I'll go into an office and I got my little notebook and I got my phone and I'll always ask permission. So on my iPhone, for instance, I'll show you real quick so you can see how I do it. Under my photos, um, I've got my albums, right? So I've got all my albums. And over here, if I go down to... um, Give me one second. I'm sorry. If I go to my albums, right? So here, I don't, I'm trying to get it to you. So you see, it says shine. I don't know. It, I, I can't really see, but that's okay. You can just say it. Okay. So, you know, I take, I have an album for each individual so that when I go to their office, like Runnels. Yeah, I see it now. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's, that's Scott Runnels' office. So when I, when I went to his office, right, I just took pictures of anything and everything that I saw. Like, for instance, this is his Invisalign sheet. So when a new patient comes in for Invisalign, when a patient comes in, it's what scan number are they on, what current aligner, what's the total aligners, and uh, what's their interval in terms of days, right? And I love that. So I, I just took a picture of it and put it into an album under his name. So I'll follow the doctor around. and and. I'll try to get him the night before if I can, and we'll have dinner. And I'll talk to him and say, tomorrow, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to follow you? Do you mind if I follow you? Do you mind if I talk to your team? What are the ground rules? And so far, nobody's ever given me any major ground rules. They say, do whatever you want to do. And that's what I told Adriana. Do whatever you want to do. Go speak to anybody you want. Talk to my patients. Talk to my team. So I'll watch the doctor for a little bit, but I don't really care about their clinical protocol unless they're doing stuff I've never seen before. I, I want to see, I want to listen to how their front desk answers the phone. I want, I want to learn what they're doing in terms of patient flow. Um, I want to know what are they doing differently in terms of check-in, check-out. Do they have an answering? I mean, I'm not asking, I'm learning. I've been in an office that doesn't check anybody out. It's all self-checkout. So I'll watch that system for a while. Um, I'll listen to how they talk to patients. I'll look at the decor in the office um, and take pictures of things that I like for my office. And generally, 
a whole day is a lot of time. So I will typically try to leave by about three or four o'clock. Now I'll show up from eight, go to lunch with them, um, talk to the team, find out why they like working there. And you'll be surprised. It, it, it'll come so natural to you as you go through it, just to sort of, you know, don't go in with an agenda. Um, Scott Runnels, who hopefully will be joining this group, Doug and I went to go see him last Monday, a week ago. He would just do whatever you want, dude. Sit in my private office and take notes if you want to. Follow me around the whole day. He's got a professional assistant who helps him do everything. So I would sit and talk to her and she would share documents with us. I'd listen to his front desk. I would, you know, he has a call center. I wanted to learn about his call center and how that was working after hours. Um, and you know, you'll come away with like 15 or 20 ideas and, and you'll, it'll just, you know, some offices are going to be very tech heavy. So you're not even going to follow the doctor that much. You're going to be asking questions about their technology and how do they do their social media and how do they, what's their number one cause of growing patients and how do they uh, interface with their doctors. And other offices are going to be very low tech, but they're going to be really hands on like Caroline, for instance. I know Caroline well enough to probably guess that she's not super tech driven, but she's very relationship driven. And Caroline, I hope I'm not Nailed speaking it. your terms, right? <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> none of you have met Caroline probably. She is one of the sweetest, kindest, most gentle people you'll ever meet. And her smile lights up a room. So, if you, no, you know it's true, Caroline. You know, we, <laughs> you know we all love you. But, you know, she's the kind of person that if she sits down in a room, you're just going to feel the warmth. So maybe I have something to learn by just watching how the culture of her office has grown from that. So every office is going to have something for you. And then you're going to go see somebody like Dave Paquette, who I went to go watch years ago. And it's all clinical. He's doing stuff that I've never seen before. So I'm going to be over his shoulder most of the day watching the clinical, and he's happy to show it. So in answering your question in a very roundabout way, Andre, just all you got to do is reach out and say, hey, can I come watch you for the day? And if someone's uncomfortable through email, it's easy for them to say no. You know, like I know one guy I asked, and he says, you know, I've really lost a lot of team members recently and it's very tough for me. Give me about six months and then I'll, you know, I'll let you come watch. I said, no problem. But virtually everybody's okay with it. And um, you'll ask them, do you want me to come meet you for dinner the night before or do you want me to just come that morning? And the dinner before is often awesome. And uh, yeah. if you have a spouse who's part of the office, I would suggest you ask if it's okay to bring your spouse along to observe and see. I wouldn't bring a TC. I wouldn't bring your team. Just come yourself and take some notes. And I've developed some amazing friendships with people by going to visit. Um, because you start seeing, like, quick one. What do you give to your patients at bonding? Right? It's a rhetorical question. You know, I give them my whiteboard video on an iPad. I give them a T-shirt that's gold on black that says, keep calm and wear braces. Right? Which is like a solid gold, like, foil. But I've been in an office, Jim Stork, who's in Des Moines, Iowa, gives out one of those little backpacks, and he, he has ICs. You know those, like, squeeze ICs? He keeps them in the freezer. They pull one out, they put it on the counter when they start bonding. By the time they're done, it's softer. The kid loves it. I've seen people give out packs of oatmeal. I mean, you get to see great ideas. And you're, you're going to be so busy taking notes, you are not going to be looking over their shoulder the whole day. You're going to be fo videoing, fo taking photos, writing stuff down and your head's going to be swimming so much that they're going to be saying to you, Hey, Andre, come here. I got, some, I want you to sit on this new patient exam. I want you to see how I do my new patient exam because people are going to be proud of things they do in their office and they're going to want you to see them. So like in my office, I want you to sit on a new patient exam to see how I'm using digital co-diagnosis to help increase treatment planning. I want you to see the iPad that patients get when we're done to see the whiteboard I created for post-operative instructions. Right. Um, you know, I want you to see me doing a, a TAD-based expander because you may not be doing them in your office and I'm doing them and I'm having fun with them. So, you know, there's, there's just so many little things. You're going to see something while I'm working on a patient and say to the assistant, what is that? And you're going to be in a 20-minute conversation with them and they know when they need to break away. So it'll be cool. So I, I, there's always an open invitation to come visit me. I'm nobody special, but, you know, if you ever want to be in a very safe environment and try it the first time, come visit me and my staff, my team would love to have you. And, you know, you're always welcome to come. I'm there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. And come as you want, leave when you want. Dinners are often tough just because of my schedule. But I promise 
and Adriana will hopefully testify to this. I'll make you feel at home the whole time you're there, I hope. And great sushi too. Oh, she's not. <laughs> Adriana, did that sushi place surprise you? Yes, it did. It is the greatest sushi in the world in the middle of a landlocked state. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know it's not totally, but it's the greatest sushi. So if you come, I'll, I'll treat you good lunch, great time, and a lot of fun. I, I appreciate it, Glenn. I mean, I, I'm sold. <laughs> I, all, all those things you mentioned, I'm going to try to schedule, you know, one office a month now. <laughs> you know, think about it. You go to a CE course, and then you're lucky if you get one good idea, two good ideas. I have pages and pages of notes from every office I visit. And whether they're a startup or somebody who's been around 25 years, you're going to come back with 15 or 20 ideas. And you're going to, on the flight back, you're going to think of the, the three or four that you need to share with your team. And I'm telling you, um, the things I'm doing in my office now that make me successful more than I was last month are things I learned from other doctors. Just simple stuff, like what kind of scrubs are they wearing? Where did they get the warm-up jacket that you love that costs 20 bucks from Sam's Club, right? That you were thinking you had to go online and buy it, but this beautiful warm-up jacket that they throw in the washing machine came from Sam's Club. Right? It's, you're going to be blindsided by how many ideas you're going to get. So is it worth to you a $400 plane ticket on a day off once a month? Absolutely. So fly in first thing in the morning, get there by nine o'clock, leave at three, make it a short, sweet visit, wake up, see your family, come home, see your, see your family, and get some great ideas in between. Will do. Yeah. Sounds good, man. So anything anybody wants to add before we sign off? Well, like I said, I would encourage you all to reach out to somebody. Um, if you have a to-do list in the next month, try to reach out. My pleasure, Rishi. Um, just reach out to somebody in the group and, and get a date to go visit their office. And if it's not somebody in your group, start off with somebody in your state who might be two, three hours away. Um, like Adriana and I, she's in Austin. I'm in Dallas. It's four hours away, right? You drive or you fly and you know, do it for the day. It's, it's low stress and make it a single day. Don't even do night before. And I would, I'm going to challenge each of you. I know it's Christmas time, so it's very tough. But by the end of January, for those of you going on the cruise, it would be wonderful for you to share with me what you've learned and what you've done. And if, not, if you're not going on the cruise, first of all, it's not too late. Um, it's going to be fun. Uh, but if you're not going on the cruise because you just can't, understandable. But by the end of January, try to be at someone else's office. And that gives you six to eight weeks to schedule something, right? So you could call somebody now and be there by the end of January. Nobody's going to feel rushed in doing that. And uh, like I said, I'm always open to all of you, but you know, I would encourage you to go to other people in other parts of the country who might be closer to you. So I wish you, um, I, 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 I don't know the date for next month's uh, web conference for the expert because of the, of the cruise and other travel, but we'll get a good one going. Uh, but before then, I just want to wish all of you a Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Great Kwanzaa, uh, whatever it is you all celebrate. I hope it's meaningful and wonderful. Um, I wish you all a Happy New Year with the best year you've ever had. And I'm not talking about finances. I hope the finances are great, but I hope it's an even better year for all of you personally. And, uh, and let's make sure that we not only do well financially, but we make our lives and those around us better every day. So I'm, I, I'm here for you unconditionally at any time, uh, in any way, for anything. So have a wonderful evening and uh, anything you need, just reach out to me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys.